In this section, we're going to think about the location and also the properties of upper and lower motor neurons. So we are looking here at upper and lower motor neurons, which are the primary components of the somatic motor system. That is the system which is involved in voluntary movement. And these are very, very important, these neurons, because damage to either upper or lower motor neurons leads to very distinctive clinical features. So first of all, let's consider uh, the properties of upper and lower motor neurons. Now, the somatic motor system is composed of a chain of two neurons. So here is our first neuron. Here is its cell body. These are multipolar neurons with many, many dendrites and a single axon emerging. What we have just drawn here is the upper motor neuron. So this is the upper motor neuron that we have drawn. And the upper motor neuron projects onto the lower motor neuron. So here is the lower motor neuron. And it is the lower motor neuron which has been called by certain researchers the final common path because it is activation of the lower motor neuron that ultimately results in activation of skeletal muscles. Now, upper motor neurons are entirely within the central nervous system. All right? So um, if we just indicate that on the left-hand side of the screen, this is the central nervous system, and on the right-hand screen, this is the peripheral nervous system. Now, the boundary between these two is approximately here, and we'll see precisely where uh, the lower motor neuron cell bodies are um, a little bit later on. But what I want you to appreciate at this moment is that upper motor neurons are entirely within the central nervous system, whereas lower motor neurons, their cell bodies and the proximal portion of their axons is in the CNS, but the more distal portions of their axons are in the peripheral nervous system. And that does, of course, have important clinical consequences because we know that the prognosis for damage to neurons in the CNS is far poorer than for damage to neurons or parts of neurons in the PNS. Okay? So, where specifically do we find the cell bodies of these upper motor neurons? Well, the, the major place that the cell bodies of upper motor neurons are found is in the primary motor cortex. Okay? So this is the primary motor cortex, which you should remember is in the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe. So the majority of the cell bodies of upper motor neurons are found within the primary motor cortex, that is the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobes. However, the locations of the lower motor neuron cell bodies are a little bit more varied. The majority, numerically speaking, of lower motor neuron cell bodies are found within the ventral horn of the spinal cord. So most of our um, lower motor neuron cell bodies are found within the spinal cord ventral horn. However, there is a large population of lower motor neuron cell bodies also found within the brainstem. And specifically, these are within the motor nuclei of the brainstem. So this is a very simple overview of the locations of upper and lower motor neurons. I just want to add one further point about upper motor neurons. Upper motor neurons are found in the primary motor cortex. An additional point is that upper motor neurons are not the following. So upper motor neurons are not found in the basal ganglia or the cerebellum. And there's a very important reason why I'm emphasising this to you.
because I don't want you to go thinking that damage to the basal ganglia or the cerebellum leads to upper motor neuron signs. Upper motor neuron signs that we'll talk about a little later on are specifically related to damage to these specific neurons originating in the primary motor cortex. Basal ganglia disorders and damage to the cerebellum lead to uh, very different um, satellites of symptoms which we shall see in different lectures. So we've talked about the basic, the very basic properties of upper and lower motor neurons. Next I want to look at more detail um, at the lower motor neurons. So let's take a look at the lower motor neurons in more detail and specifically what I want to do is I want to look at where they are found within the central nervous system. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the location of lower motor neurons. And in order to do that, let's just draw our outline of the central nervous system. So here is the uh, cerebral cortex with its folded surface. And then I'm going to do the brain stem. So we have midbrain, pons and medulla, then spinal cord. And then this comes back up like this and forms the medulla, pons and midbrain just there. Uh, we could add the midline, although we're not going to be adding on any crossing axons, so I'm not going to do that on this particular occasion. So the first population of lower motor neurons I want to indicate to you is the spinal cord ventral horns. Now, you're used to seeing the ventral horns of the spinal cord depicted a bit like this. So here's a cross-section through the cord. Here's its central canal with its central a butterfly shaped area of grey matter and you're used to seeing a transverse section like this and being told well if this is the ventral or anterior side this is the dorsal or posterior side you're used to being told that that is the ventral horn there. Now that's absolutely fine looking at the transverse section however really what I want you to start to appreciate now is that the ventral horns are three-dimensional. They're not just this little bit of these butterflies' wings. They're actually three-dimensional cylinders of grey matter running the full length of the spinal cord. So really, the ventral horns, when we're looking in this kind of overview, um, they are longitudinal structures running the full length of the spinal cord. And as we said... Um, in, in, in our first lecture, um, these columns of neurons within the spinal cord, grey matter, may supply a specific muscle, for example. So two particular levels of the spinal cord, i.e. a three-dimensional chunk of the uh, ventral horn, supplies a particular muscle. So, so the ventral horn is very important for us to conceptualise them as three-dimensional cylinders of grey matter running longitudinally through the spinal cord. Next, we need to realise that grey matter um, and lower motor neuron grey matter specifically is represented in the brainstem. Um, an important concept I want to try to get across to you is the idea that really the, the brainstem it's very, very closely related to the spinal cord. And I know that this is a very crude way of thinking about things and it's not entirely accurate, but it is helpful when you're trying to learn this. Just imagine that over evolutionary time, the most primitive animals had a spinal cord with this basic wiring. And then as animals became more sophisticated, they added on this brainstem on top of the spinal cord. And in fact, the the morphology of the brainstem is very, very similar to the morphology of the spinal cord. And the grey matter in the spinal cord, these three-dimensional columns of grey matter forming the ventral horn or the dorsal horn, actually extend up into the brainstem as cell columns composed of a whole series of different sensory or motor nuclei. Just to repeat, the dorsal horn extends up into the brainstem, as a series of sensory nuclei, and the ventral horn extends up into the brainstem as a series of motor nuclei.
And this is a very useful concept because it helps you to appreciate that there is a very close affiliation between spinal nerves formed from the spinal cord and cranial nerves formed generally from the brainstem. So let's draw on some of these cranial nerve nuclei. There are many of them, their names um, are quite confusing and I'm not going to name them, I'm just going to point them out to you and tell you the cranial nerves that they are relevant to. So up at the level of the midbrain, so I'll just put M for midbrain, P for pons and ME for medulla. Up at the level of the midbrain we have two important um, sets of motor nuclei. These are specifically uh, nuclei containing lower motor neurons for cranial nerves. Um, we have the third nerve motor nucleus, the ocular motor nucleus, and we have the trochlear nucleus here, i.e. the nucleus for the fourth cranial nerve. So this is the third nerve nucleus, and this is the fourth nerve nucleus, and you can see that there is one on each side. And in fact, it might be helpful for me to just put the midline on at this point. Now, the third nerve nuclei contain lower motor neurons which travel along the ocular motor nerve and supply extraocular muscles. So the third nerve ocular motor nuclei contain lower motor neurons whose axons are distributed along the third nerve and supply extraocular muscles. The fourth nerve, or trochlear nuclei, contain lower motor neurons whose axons are distributed along the fourth cranial nerve, the trochlear nerve, and supply superior oblique. So here is the third and the fourth cranial nerve nuclei. Now, what comes after four? Five, all right? And we know that um, the trigeminal nerve uh, has a couple of quite large motor nuclei, and these trigeminal motor nuclei are very important because they are distributed along um, the, mag the, uh, the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve to supply the muscles of mastication. So the trigeminal motor nucleus contains lower motor neuron cell bodies which supply the muscles of mastication via the trigeminal nerve. The sixth cranial nerve... Uh, we know emerges at approximately the junction between the pons and the medulla. And we know once again that the sixth cranial nerve is one of the nerves supplying extraocular muscles. In this case, it's the lateral rectus. So the sixth cranial nerve nucleus contains lower motor neuron cell bodies, which supply the lateral rectus via the abducens nerve. Next... Um, and sitting once again um, within the pons, we have uh, a very important um, set of nuclei. Um, I mean, these are right at the top of the medulla, bottom of the pons. Um, but these are the facial motor nuclei. So these are the motor nuclei for the facial nerve, the seventh cranial nerve. And the facial motor nuclei contain um, the cell bodies of lower motor neurons whose axons distribute along the facial nerve to supply the muscles of facial expression. So that's the facial motor nucleus. And, and in later sections, we're going to look at the upper motor neuron supply of the facial motor nucleus in more detail, uh, because that's actually quite interesting and clinically very, very relevant. Now, the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibular cochlear nerve, has no motor component, so we won't include it. However, the... 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th cranial nerves, all of those do have um, a, a motor component, a somatic motor component, so we'll include those. Now, the nucleus for the 9th, 10th and 11th cranial nerves is quite elongated, and we see that here. All right, so this is the nucleus for the 9th, 10th and 11th cranial nerves. As I said, I'm not expecting you to know the names of these, um, but just appreciate that the lower motor neurons that are distributed along the 9th, 10th and 11th cranial nerves are in this elongated nucleus.
within the medulla. And finally, the twelfth cranial nerve, once again this is an elongated nucleus but I've kind of not got the space to show you that so I'm just going to put it as a blob down here in the caudal medulla. The twelfth cranial nerve, the hypoglossal nucleus, also has its own nucleus containing lower motor neurons that distribute to the tongue through the hypoglossal nerve. All right. So this very briefly shows you the locations of low motor neurons within the central nervous system. Um, with, they're within the spinal cord ventral horn and within a series of interrupted nuclei within the brainstem. Thank you for listening.